back in our Father's Word, Exodus chapter 2. We're going to pick it up with verse 17 here in a moment. Remember this, Exodus means the going forth or the going out, going into the promised land. It sets an example of where we sit in this generation of the fig tree because we're about to go into that promised land. And it, it makes it especially interesting that all these things, even down to the savior of this particular age, little old Moses, placed in a little ark by his mother, cast into the, the mighty river, and Pharaoh's daughter has that little ark brought to her when it was spotted, and that babe wept, and there was one tear came from that eye, and it melted her heart. And little old Miriam was close by, and and she said, would you like for me to get a nurse for you for the baby? And naturally, Pharaoh's daughter said, yes. She went and got his own mother. And Pharaoh's daughter paid the mother to nurse her own child, Moses. And, and uh, how fantastic it is. She, call, she is the one that called him Moses. Moses in the Egyptian tongue means saved by the water. In the Hebrew tongue, it means drawn from the water. That, that's kind of a coincidence, perhaps, maybe. God's way of letting us n name this child. And he grew mighty and was a great uh, warrior for Pharaoh. But he saw his own people. And one was being really abused because of the rigor, the chastisement that was brought upon them, the working. And he killed him, killed the Egyptian. Well, Pharaoh, you know, that, that's a death sentence in Egypt to kill an Egyptian without Pharaoh's permission. So Moses had to run, and boy, did he run. He went, he went to this land, actually the land of the Kenites, and, but he ends up at a particular well of one Median priest who had seven daughters, and um, they are, they are not, it, this is not their homeland. They're living in the land of the Kenites. As a matter of fact, Jethro would even be called a Kenite in one place or another, because, simply by, by, by geographical reasoning, not race. So anyway, Moses, where we pick it up here today, uh, the Kenites came up, the girls had drawn water for their sheep, and the Kenites were driving them away. And when Moses saw what was happening, he took care of business. He ran the whole bunch of Kenites away. That's where we pick it up in the 17th verse of the second chapter of the great going out, the book of Exodus. Uh, verse 17, and it reads with that word of wisdom from our father. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. He not only drove the Kenite shepherds away, but he, he drew more water for the girls where they could water their flock, 18. And when they came to Ruel, that's, that's their father, he said, how is it that you're come so soon today? Why is it you're home so early? Um, Ruel means... Uh, um, uh, friend of Yah, friend of God, and, and he was. Um, he was not an Ethiopian, as many people would say. As you read in the 25th chapter of Genesis, the great book of Genesis, you find out that he is a Midianite, which is um, from Abraham's second wife, Keturah, and um, is of the Abrahamic stock, Ruel, friend of God. Verse 19, and they said, an Egyptian. Why would they call Moses an Egyptian? His dress. He was right straight out of Egypt. An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. Now, I'm going to take advantage of this to teach a lesson that you need to really pay, pay close attention to what you're reading. We've already read in this book that a Levite married another Levite and sired this child. So this child is not an Egyptian by birth, he's a Levite. 
of the tribe of Levi, a priest and a prophet. So you have to be real careful, even though it says in the Bible that he's an Egyptian, only by geographical location. Example, I, I was born in Oklahoma. I live in Arkansas. Geographically, I'm an Arkansan. By birth, I'm, I like to say Oki. A lot of people resent that. I love it. Okay. But by birth, I'm an Oki. But <clears throat> by nationality, I'm an Irish Scotchman uh, of, um, of the House of Ulster. And how precious it is. You see, so you, you have to watch the genealogies. And, and when you're reading, go to the base so that you have a good understanding. Because if you're not careful, there are some people teach that Moses married an Ethiopian. That's a lie. He married a woman that lived in Ethiopia. But she was of the tribe Keturah Abraham Median. As a matter of fact, her father was a priest there, meaning he was full blood or he could not have been a priest. Okay? End of story. Be careful when you study genealogies. Verse 20. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that you have left a man? Question. Call him that he may eat bread. He just did this good favor for you. Bring him home. Verse 21, And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. A little, uh, um, little sparrow of Yah, or a little bird of Yahweh, our Heavenly Father. That's what her name means. Uh, verse 22, And she bare him a son, and he called his name uh, Gerson. Um, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. And um, Gerson means he's a stranger here. Th that kind of answers what I've been saying about the genealogies. This child was a stranger there. It was not his land, even though they lived there. Verse 23, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. It was terrible. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. God hears his children. I mean, when it said that those taskmasters brought over them rules that were rigorous, it meant crushing. They were crushing rules. They were going, God intended that they be there 400 years, but he did not intend that the Egyptians should take advantage of the situation. They certainly did. He heard the children, 24, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Uh, that, that's a good point for you to absorb also. God never forgets. And that's why the covenants are ever so important. God never goes back on his word. And when he makes a covenant, it is rock solid. You can count on it. That's the way it's going to be. And when, when we started this book, I took you back to chapter 15 in Genesis and read where God said, you're going to go into captivity to a strange people for 400 years. It, that also was his plan. But he didn't plan on all this rigorous control. Next verse, verse 25. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. He, he felt for them. Our father is a very tender person. He really hears, or God, perhaps I should say, or lest some be offended. He is very tender in as much as he loves his children. And he does have respect for them. This is why in the book of Hosea, he would call them at one time, which means not pitied or, or not loved. And then he changed that name to Ruhama, which means I love them. They're my children. 
So he remembers his covenants. And he's weeping with and for his children. He's going to do something about it. Verse 3, chapter 3, rather, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro. Now here, Jethro is a title. Ruel is his name of, of the father of the girls. Jethro means um, his excellency. That's his title as a priest, okay? His father-in-law, the priest of Median, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb, which means desert at Sinai. Okay. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, but behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Three, and Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Now, you must know that your father is a consuming fire only consumes, the beauty of his fire is that it only consumes what he chooses to consume. What he chooses not to consume that is natural is not consumed. Take the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace with the Son of God walking with them. They weren't singed. God conceited that. Okay. And, and how precious it is that the Holy Spirit being that fire that burns some and warns the heart of others when they feel the touch of the living God through the Holy Comforter, the Holy Spirit, covenanted and promised by the Lord Jesus Christ himself on those 40 days that he would walk from Passover to his ascension and 10 days later we would receive that comforter, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And it's always been with us. He's in charge. He's in control. But here, he's getting Moses' attention to send him on a mission. Verse 4, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Verse 5, And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And it was. God had made it so. Why? The angel of the Lord was there, which means God's own, own being. Verse 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Naturally, it was said, if you looked upon the face of God, you died. Well, he wasn't, because it's a different dimension. There was no danger of that. God was simply giving a sign in this burning flame. What, what did he place, when he drove man out of the Garden of Eden, what did he place there? Two beings with flaming, that's fiery swords to protect it. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God pays attention. Those taskmasters were cruel, inhumane, asking more than what was even want. Our people can cut it, though. When they're driven, they get healthier the stronger they work. The more they work, the stronger they grow. Verse 8, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place 
of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And naturally, Jebusites built Jebus, which would later be named Jerusalem after David would take it. These were foreign lands. God gave it to them. He was going to see to it that they had it. And so it is. And, and uh, so it was. Uh, the father loves his children. He, he does correct. Every, every father that loves children corrects them. That's, that's part of maturity, as a mother or a father will do, to keep order in a family. Well, our Heavenly Father is no different. As, as it is written in Hebrews chapter 12, the first few, six verses of that great book, it stipulates that as long as God loves you, he's going to correct you. He, he's going to scourge you. When he ceases that, it means he doesn't love you anymore. That means you're in a heap of hurt. To continue. And now, therefore, behold, the city of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have, I have um, the cry, rather, of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. I said, I'm, I'm observing it. I can hear their cry. This is why you may not believe that prayer helps in these end times. God hears it. He knows when his children are oppressed. He knows when they need him. You know, he's still on the throne. And I got some good news for you. He's going to stay there. He's in charge. And he hears the cry of his children even in these end times when they try to remove the name of God from our vocabulary, from uh, giving us signs such as standards, the very flag of our nation. That's a standard. Our people, all the tribes have always had a standard, which is to say a flag. And now they don't even want our children to make, play a pledge of allegiance to our flag that is one nation under God and, and is to be respected. Here's all this. So don't ever forget to let him know when you're unhappy about something, talk to him about it. It brings him down. He's come down now to talk to Moses. Verse 10. Come now, uh, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm sure Moses' mind is really whirling. I mean, he murdered, he killed a man there. And he knows that Pharaoh wants to kill him. And God is going to send him there, one man, to free all the house of Israel? Just, just think a moment what's going through his mind. And then remember something. If God sends you on a mission, you and God make a majority. Because if God be with you, who can be against you? Verse 11, And Moses said unto God, Who am I? I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Who am I and what am I that I could accomplish this? Verse 12, And he said, Certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Right here. You're going to bring them right back here and you're going to serve God here. And, and so it would be. But I, I want you to underline that in your mind. Certainly. I will be with thee when God is with you. You can't miss. God gives you what you need for the moment, the message for the hour, what the children need to hear for that specific time in the, the, this world age. 
And so it is that our Father on that throne is always in control. Moses still having a little trouble with this. Who am I? <laughs> you know, I mean, they ran me out of there. They tried to kill me. 13, and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, what is his name? And remember in the Hebrew, um, Viela Shemeh is the name of this book. What the, these are the names. Okay. So by it being the name of the book, it becomes very important to you. What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Question. 14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And there you have the sacred name, I am the vine, I am the light, I am the life. I am the living water, the water that you can partake of and never thirst again spiritually. That is the sacred name. Now, what is I am that I am in English when you translate that back to the Hebrew? It is Iya Asha Iya. And from that, you have the etymology that brings forth, forth the four consonants, Y-H-V-H. -H. Now, you're going to have some that will say, well, it should be Y-H-W-H, -H, and that's just not true. Well, how can you be so sure? Because it's in the Word. Okay. In the very book of Esther, it's locked in five times. It is locked in two times forward, two times reversed, and one time as I am that I am in the Hebrew tongue. And, and um, the reason you know that it is Y-H-V-H is because the word, the, the letter V comes from the Hebrew word and, which is the. Now, let me ask you a question. Just to show you the ignorance of some people, and I'm, I'm not knocking them or judging them. They just don't know. But ve can no way be pronounced wa. Okay, it just won't fly. And the manuscripts lock it into where man cannot mess with it. Therefore, the consonants are y h v h. You with Companion Bibles, you have an entire appendix on this in the acrostics. Check it out, and it will take you to that book of Esther and will absolutely show you the sacred name locked in. Is it important? That's the name of this book. V'elishema. These are the names. It is important. This is one of the reasons I've taken so many, so much pains in explaining Egyptian, Ethiopian, and so forth, Levite, to stick to the ground so that you know and understand that it's important. And naturally, the Word of God is for all people. But you still must be truthful with the Word of God. So, that's where the term I am comes from. And that's why Jesus would say, I am the vine. And we're the branches. And you get a branch that doesn't produce fruit, guess what happens to it? God prunes it. Whack. It's gone. Okay. So um, there you have it. Um, from right straight out of the New Testament. So there, there you have it. He said, this is what you tell them. This is who sent you. We, we have here at the chapel, as you come onto our property, a huge granite stone stating, I am that I am, huge granite sign, so that it leaves no doubt these are the names 
that are worshipped here. Verse 15 to continue. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. I'm not going to change it. This is my memorial unto all generations. So it's important that you know his name. It truly is. He loves it when you know his name. It's important to him. You know, how do you feel when someone's talking to you, let's say that your name is John, and somebody comes up and says, hey, Pete, how are you doing? Well, you're not Pete. Okay. So you would rather be called by your own name, John. And it's just that God is no different. He wants to be called by his own name. And if you understand what I'm saying, that's fine. If you don't, put it on the shelf and go on your way. You're doing good. Verse 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. I want you to tell them that I know. I know what's happening. Verse 17. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Our Father always blesses his own children with prosperity, with freedom. The ten tribes coming, many of them, to this great nation from the house of Israel. How precious it is. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. If you're blessed from God. Verse 18. And they shall hearken to thy voice. They're going to listen and thou shalt come, and, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and you shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go. We beseech thee three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Now, he knows when they get three days out, they're hauling. They're gone. So God himself will use a little um, uh, covert action of persuasion. But if they get three days out there, they're out of here. Okay. And God knows it. 19. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. He's not going to allow it. I can tell you now before you tell him, he's going to say no. But this is the way you hammer, okay? Well, how do you know that? Well, God himself is going to harden his heart. He's going to harden Pharaoh's heart to make this go down as it is. Verse 20. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. You can count on it. When the Father promises you something, you can rest assured that's exactly how it's going to be. So here we have quite a chapter here that you learn the sacred name. You learn what God's name is. Is it just part time? No, it's forever. You know, the, the earth age, age changes to a new age, but God's word and his name never changes. Always the same. Verse 21. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go out, 
You shall not go empty. You're going to leave there wealthy people. Why? Verse 22 to finish the chapter. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor. This is shall ask rather than borrow. And of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and you shall spoil the Egyptians. Fine, that's their payday. They've earned it. They served under rigor, rigor, the taskmasters, in building Pharaoh his cities and places and things. And they're going out with a great deal more than they came in with. It will be... It will be interesting when you see how our people, when they find that freedom, how sometimes they can interact and react. There's nothing new under the sun. People, God created them many years ago, and you know something? They're still the same. They're still God's children. And they need our Heavenly Father. But if you're not familiar with His Word, His contracts... That is to say, the vows he has made to us, then certainly you are amiss many times in what the future brings. Our Father is so very good to us. He's given us a lot of information on finding happiness in that third chapter. That's the way you find happiness, is to be pleasing to Almighty God. For when you please him, he's certainly going to be pleased with you. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. You listen a moment, won't you please?